A great controversy rages between good and evil, and humanity is caught in the crossfire. Satan has crafted his most cunning end-time deceptions, but his plans are doomed to fail. Get ready to anchor your minds in truth as the Bible exposes his lies and prepares us for our soon coming Savior. And now, live from the Campus Hill Church of Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California, we bring you this presentation of The Great Controversy, End Time Deceptions. Hello and welcome to 3EBN's Winter Camp Meeting here in sunny Loma Linda, California. My name is Jill Morricone and we're so glad each one of you are here and we're so glad you have joined us at home. Our message this afternoon will be brought by my pastor, Pastor John Lomacane. He's the pastor of the Thompsonville Seventh-day Adventist Church. He's a man of God, a man of the Word, and I know the Lord has an incredible message for us this afternoon through him. Before he comes to present the Word of God, we're going to hear from some dear friends of the ministry, Reggie and Lady Love Smith. I love it when they sing, there is an anointing on them. And the song they will be ministering is, Great is Thy Faithfulness. After they shall have sung, the next voice you will hear is that of our pastor and friend, John Lomacain. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. So great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercy. And all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. So great is thy faithfulness, Lord.
Can we say amen again? Amen. Thank you so much, Reggie and Lady. We are here because God's faithfulness is always great. This afternoon, I'd like to invite you to calibrate your thinking. They've given me the message entitled, Following Stars and Spirits. And I'd like to subtitle it, Pandora's Box. But before we go any further, let's ask for the Spirit of God to guide and speak through my heart. Father in heaven, this is your opportunity. I am your servant. Speak so that your name may be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In Revelation 9, the Apostle John introduces us to an unimaginable scene. I read Revelation chapter 9. Verse 1 and 2. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. The Apostle John makes it clear in Revelation chapter 12 who this fallen star really is. Follow God's word. Revelation 12, beginning with verse 7. And war broke out where? In heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought but they did not prevail. Can you say amen? amen? They did not win. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. He continues, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives how much of the world? The whole world. The whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. John makes it clear that the star that he had seen falling from heaven was none other than the dragon, the serpent of old, the devil, and Satan. Isaiah the prophet chimes in and gives credibility to what John finds. Isaiah 14, verse 12, we read, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? That means the morning star. Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? And then finally, if Isaiah is not enough and John is not enough, I pray that Jesus is enough. Luke 18, Luke 10 and verse 18, the words of Jesus. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to palpable darkness, thick darkness. This darkness is no ordinary darkness, nor is it an incidental darkness. This darkness is not the residual after effect of falling rain. It's far deeper than that. Nor is it the production of colliding ear masses. The darkness that exists in our world today, if Adam can only rewind the videotape, I believe his choice would have been quite
the prophet Isaiah introduces this anomaly with the following description. Isaiah 60 and verse 2. The prophet says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. You see, God predicted that darkness was the pandemic that would accompany the introduction of evil. And if you pause and look at our world today, God's word was correct. Our world is a world of intense darkness. If we can only see the world from God's point of view, we can conclude what kind of world this is. I was raised in the city of New York. I go back to the streets of Brooklyn, the streets of Manhattan, and back in the 70s and 80s, it was dark, but I have news for you today. Darkness is not localized to the city of New York. Come on, somebody. Darkness is not localized to the city of Los Angeles. You can even find darkness in Loma Linda. God predicted that darkness was the pandemic that would accompany the introduction of evil. For you see, the eviction of Satan was the introduction of something that I call the proverbial Pandora's box. Now, what is Pandora's box? In Greek mythology, Pandora's box is an artifact or a golden box with a lid connected to the myth of Pandora. According to the myth, when Pandora opened her golden box, the evils contained in it were released. Evils that did not exist and were not known prior to the box being opened. As long as the box remained closed, the evils were contained. When you go back in the beginning of the great controversy, although there was war in heaven, Evils were not yet released in the world. Even though Satan is the inventor of every evil device, evil could not enter the world until the box was opened. And the Bible tells us how that box was opened. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, we read these following words. Therefore, just as through one man, how many men? One man, sin entered the world, and death through sin. And thus, death spread to all men because how many of us? All have sinned. When Adam sinned, he had no concept of the seemingly eternal and lethal pandemic of evil that would be unleashed on our world. And today, all you got to do is turn the news on. All you got to do is remember the community you were raised in. All you've got to do is look at the movies that are being shown today. All you've got to do is put your ear to the radio, put your ear to the internet, and you'll find that what Adam did not see is prevailing in every corner of the world today. When Adam opened Pandora's box, listen carefully, every sinfully wicked and morally depraved act was born. If he had only known, I think his decision would have been different. When Adam sinned, malicious, can I be clear today? Malicious, corrupt, debased, vile, nefarious, pernicious, and destructive inventions were initiated. Inventions that would parlay the human imagination were released on the world when Adam sinned. Every demonic act of cruelty was conceived. Every reprehensible despicable and wretched attitude into the world. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Speaking about evil, William Shakespeare said, hell is empty. All the demons are right here. When Adam sinned, Satan pounded his chest in victory and disguised himself further. Today, darkness is embraced as light, and light is rejected as darkness. Following the entrance of sin, Satan set out to accomplish every claim that he made, and his highest ambition, Isaiah 14, verse 14, says the following words. Satan said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like together the Most High. In his quest to be like the Most High, Satan began with a checklist. 
and what a checklist it was. You see, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that this is not the world that God intended. Can somebody say amen? This is a world that's far different from the Garden of Eden. If Adam only had known what would happen in our world today, just think about it. Every disease, right now we are in the midst of a disease that can become a pandemic. Every disease, every war, every act of hatred, every violent act, every act of rebellion. And by the way, let me make it clear, I'm not going to polish it today. In order for us to understand how much we need a Savior, we've got to understand how bad it really is. Every act of violence, every act of rebellion was released when Satan began to go down his checklist. Look at the first thing he decided. Isaiah 14 and verse 13. The Lord said to Lucifer, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God are the angels of heaven. And Revelation 12, verse 4 tells us that when Satan sinned, he was successful. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. So Satan was no longer alone in his campaign against heaven. He succeeded. Think about this. Perfect angels, perfect intellect, never knowing sin before. If Satan was successful in deceiving them, how much danger are we in? Perfect beings, never knowing angel, never knowing evil, never knowing darkness. Satan methodically went from one angel to the next. And the Bible says by the multitude of his training, he traded truth for error, light for darkness, loyalty for rebellion. By the multitude of his trading, he succeeded in deceiving one-third of the angels of heaven. And the Bible says they were thrown to the earth. Satan was no longer alone in his campaign against heaven. He succeeded, and today our world is wrapped in demonic activity. Can I be plain today? Listen carefully. Just in the UK alone, this statistic blew me away, just in the United Kingdom alone, pagans, Wicca, Druids, pantheists, heathens, witchcraft, shamanism, animism, the idea that plants have souls, the occult world, and the philemic world. In England alone, there are, as we sit here today, and by the way, this will startle you, as of 2011, what year did I say? As of 2011, there were 80,000 registered witches in England alone. But it gets darker than that. According to a website called bookroo.com, they published recently a list, just released about a week ago, a list of the top 55 books recommended to teach children about witchcraft. That's just the top 55. That's not the 238 that they left out. Just the top 55. Let me say something. Parents, when we fail to train our children, somebody else will. I went even further in my research. A major nationwide superstore, I won't name what it is, now carries more than 1,000 children's books on the subjects of the paranormal, the occult, and the supernatural. You can go to these superstores in any community, in any state, in any neighborhood, and sometimes on different parts of the globe. And you can pick from any 1,000 books. And children today are buying them. My wife and I was at a store once buying something for our nieces a number of years ago. And we went to the checkout counter. And right at the checkout counter, we found there were seven books on how to cast spells for teenage girls. If you saw somebody had a boyfriend you want, here's the spell to cast to get that girl's boyfriend. If you didn't like what your parents said, here's the spell to cast to get your parents to allow you to be rebellious. Now, that's just the tip of the iceberg. If we can see the world that God sees, what a generation would we see? We are living in a generation called Generation Z. 
from 1995 to 2012. In China, this is where it began. In China, today where this pandemic is now beginning to grab the world, where it's beginning to grip the world, in China, they began to notice that among the young folk of that nation, even the communist leaders began to lose a grip on the young people. As soon as they got access to their iPhones, they began to ignore the beliefs of the communist society. They began to rebel against everything that they, began, they were taught as young people. They began to turn their minds away. They chose not to listen. They had their cell phones. Cell phones today, my brethren, we've got to be smarter than our cell phones. Devices, the generation that forgot God, according to one recent research, Generation Z, the generation born before, between 1995 and 2012, they stated that that is the least godly generation in the last 100 years. So you wonder why it's hard to find young people that want to live like Christians. This is the generation that they said is most likely, as the statistics point out, one-third of that generation does not claim to be Christian at all. And the other two-thirds of Generation Z, are you listening? The other two-thirds of Generation Z, they build their Christianity based on the occult world, on the dream catchers, on spiritists, and they said they even set up Harry Potter as their religious icon. That's the generation we live in. That's why the Bible said as it was in the days of Noah. What happened in Noah's day? The thoughts and intents of their hearts were only evil. How long? Continually. That's why it's difficult to get young folk nowadays to think about godly things. The Bible says in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, and by the way, you'll notice in the Bible, there is a particular cadence. One of the signs that tells me that Jesus is soon to come is the very description that I'm about to read to you in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. If you follow the cadence, the first time the world was destroyed was in the pre-flood generation known as the Antediluvians. And the knowledge of God was at its lowest point. When God called Abraham, the knowledge of God was almost completely obliterated from the world. Then you go fast forward. When God raised up the Jewish nation, he gave them the gospel to give to the rest of the world. But when Jesus came, the servant of the Lord, Ellen White, says that Jesus came at the darkest point in human history. You notice the cadence. Light increases, then darkness comes in. Light increases again, then darkness comes in. Jesus, the light of the world, comes and he finds a generation in darkness. A generation, hear me carefully, that kept the Sabbath, had a good diet. You can breathe. <laughs> they had all the doctrines correct, but they became the victims of the darkness of their generation. When Jesus came, even some of the stories told in Scripture showed the darkness that began to seep in the generation in Christ's day. One of the examples you find is when Jesus stayed away for four days before he raised Lazarus. The reason why he stayed away for four days is because the belief of the immortality of the soul had already permeated the Jewish society. They believed that the soul was immortal and that when a person died, for three days the soul tried to get back into the body. If it succeeded, the person would come back to life after three days. So that's why Jesus stayed away four days. He wanted to make it clear that there is no life unless we are connected with the resurrection and the life. That's why he stayed away for four days. They knew that Jesus, they said, Lazarus is sleeping, and his disciples said, he's not feeling well. If he's sleeping, he needs the rest. And Jesus then said plainly, Lazarus is dead. And when he got there and met Martha, she said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I praise the Lord. Everybody sleeping in Jesus will come forth from the grave one day. But there is no such thing as the immortality of the soul. And so the question is why does this generation believe that? Listen to Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. The Bible says, when all that generation, that means when all the godly leaders had been gathered to their fathers, when Joshua died and the elders died and the leaders of Israel that held a high standard died, the Bible says, arose another generation, arose after them that did, did not know the Lord nor the works which he had done for Israel. This is the generation that does not know God. 
You may be shielded here in Loma Linda, but even in little Thompsonville, Illinois, where we have 550 people, we know that even there, there's a generation that does not know God. The Bible continues. You see, the fact of the matter is the devil is doing what many parents fail to do. And this is a powerful scripture, but understand the two sides of it. Here's what the Bible says. Proverbs 22, verse 6. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now watch this. The devil knows that text. So what he does, he aims at the children. So if he can train up a child from young in the way that he should go, if he trains a child in evil, you don't outgrow evil. You don't outgrow righteousness. You have to be trained in the way that you should go. That's why, parents, if we fail to do what God has called us to do, the devil will do it for us. Train up a child in the way that they should go. The same principle applies to good and evil. When we train children, when I was being raised... I remember very well, I was raised by a lady that made me go to church whether I wanted to go or not. Anybody else can say amen to that? I didn't get a choice on Sabbath morning whether or not I'm going to stay home. If I was breathing, I was going to church. She would say to me when the Sabbath was coming in, get your suit ready, iron your clothes, get your shirt together, and if I didn't iron my suit, I'd be going to church with a crinkled suit, but I was going anyway. Can I get a witness somewhere? <laughs> but nowadays, parents say to kids, do you want to go to church? I don't know. I said years ago, if you, want to learn how to, if you don't know how to raise kids, take them to the West Indies. Or maybe to Puerto Rico. You'll get that on Tuesday. We got to train our children so that they can be raised in the fear and admonition of the Word of God. What do you say? When we consider what's taking place in our society today, witches and warlocks and demons and mediums, the Bible forbids all such practices. Look at Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 to 11. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 to verse 11. Notice the word of God. And I thank God, let me say that again, I thank God that we don't have to guess about God's position concerning evil. What do you say? Here's what he says. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. And what we don't understand, the birth of all these dark demonic practices found their inception in the Garden of Eden. When Eve had a conversation with a fallen angel, described now as the serpent, he made a statement then that has been living for the last 6,000 plus years as though it's based on God's word. Here's what he said to Eve. God had told her, the day you eat thereof you will surely die. But Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4, all these omens and sorcerers and spells and mediums and spiritists are all existing because of this lie. Here's what he said, and I think you know. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not together. You will not surely die. Do you know that the safest place in Loma Linda is a cemetery? <laughs> How many of you would like to spend the weekend in the cemetery? Come on, raise your hand with me. I will. I put my wallet on the gravesite. I wake up in the morning, my wallet will be where I put it the night before. Come on, somebody. Some of y'all don't believe that. Some of y'all Christians still think, you know, I went to one of my members' house once. I, was, I, had a, I had a head elder that was from Panama. And he said, Pastor, when you come visit me, knock three times on my door. I said, why three times? He said, because spirits knock twice. So I went to visit him, my wife and I, I knocked twice. And I heard him behind the door, but he wasn't, he wasn't letting on that he was in there. So I knocked hard twice again. And he said, who is it? I said, brother, open the door, it's pastor. 
He said, why didn't you knock three times? I said, because a spirit is here. <laughs> God's spirit. Come on, somebody, say me. <laughs> the belief in the immortal soul has given impetus to every genre of evil. Think about it. How ironic it is that the distorted belief about the soul is supported for 6,000 6, years in every society, in every generation. There's some belief that souls, that the body has this soul that departs at the time of death and either goes to heaven or goes to hell or roams the earth. This belief has been based on the ideology, as Satan said, you will not surely die. And today, even among Christians, I did this, I put this to the test. I was in Jamaica not too long ago. And no, if, if you know anything about the West Indies, they got all kinds of spirits in the West Indies. At least they believe they do. And I said to this Jamaican audience, how many of you would be willing to spend the night in the cemetery? Nobody raised their hand. I said, even among those of you that claim to be Adventists, you ought to understand that we can trust God's word. What do you say? Yeah. If God said they're dead, they are dead. My mother died. She never came back to visit me. My father, both of my fathers died, both of my mothers died. When I took them to the cemetery, they never followed me home. <laughs> I never got an email. I didn't see no strange things around my house. Here's the point. What you believe creates your anomaly. Yes. The condition of your mind, there's some people that will come visit us in Thompsonville. I remember some people came from New York once to visit my wife and I. They were from Brooklyn, New York, and from our house to their car was about 18 feet. They said, walk us to our car. I said, it's right there. They said, but it's dark. <laughs> I said, we in the country, the worst thing could happen to you, you might run into a deer. They said, no, nah, could you walk us to our car? I said, you're from Brooklyn and you're afraid of the country? <laughs> they made us walk them to their car. You see, the problem is not what's happening around us. The problem is what's happening where? In us. When you allow God's word to come in, it, it banishes all darkness. The entrance of God, God's word gives light. How ironic that that lie is still existing today. Let me give you a few examples. Today, people believe that their dead relatives can still contact them. Other, others believe that their dead relatives are now their guardian angels. I have relatives that believe that. I have relatives that are still sending happy birthdays to my grandmother in heaven. That's what they say. Grandma, we know you're up there. Happy birthday. And I can't hesitate to tell them that. Grandma ain't in heaven. She's in the graveyard in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. <laughs> Not too long ago, my uncle passed away. They said, I can see uncle now in heaven playing baseball with the Yankees. I said, the Yankees are in New York, not in heaven. And as funny as it sounds, this is what's creating room for Satan to work. Some people ask the dead for advice. Praise God, they don't get any responses. Others talk openly to their dead, waiting for answers from the other side. Some go to the cemetery and talk to the grave as though they are listening. And I know for some people that's a point of comfort. But my brethren, you could do better if you just talk to the Lord. Some say that they died and floated above their bodies before returning. And there are all kinds of books being written. And it's amazing how the devil uses children. Have you ever noticed that? He uses an innocent child. I, I, I discovered not too long ago there was a book written by a little boy that claimed to have died and gone to heaven. Well, many, many years later, he began to sue the network that had aired his story. And it was amazing what he wrote. He said to the network, my father and I made that story up just to get publicity. And then he said, if you would only read your Bible, you'll understand the truth of God's word, and this lie could never have lived. And I'm paraphrasing that, by the way, but you look it up, you'll see it yourself. He said, I went to heaven, and he brought back messages. There are those that said, I went to hell, and God told me everything's going to be all right because so-and-so is not there. I was watching a story once on television. One of those court shows. And the sad reality in the courtroom, the lady that was on trial had killed the wife of the man who was in the courtroom watching the judge read the verdict. And they were sentencing this woman, and they gave the family a chance to say something to the person that was convicted. So the, so the husband came up to the podium because the woman that had killed his wife was sentenced to death. 
And he said to the woman in the court, I cannot wait till you die. My wife is waiting in heaven to settle the score. Some say they died and went to heaven and returned with a message from God. Others claim to have the ability to conjure up spirits of the dead. And some say that they have embraced their children when they have reappeared. I had a phone call from a young boy who was nine years old. He said, Pastor, young boy from Florida, beautiful little southern accent. He said, my mama keeps visiting me. I said, why are you afraid? He said, because my mama died two years ago. I said, next time... You see a spirit that looks like your mom. Here's what you need to do. He said, yes, sir. And he did it, and he called me back a few months later and said he never happened again. Because what people don't know, and here's the thing that the devil does. He makes us think, Lord have mercy. He makes us think that there is privileged information between you and your relative that he has no access to. So he says, uh, the medium. I see somebody now, uh, they have on a red shirt, uh, their favorite number is 23, and uh, they like baseball, and they want me to tell you that Jerry is going to be okay. And they say, I watch the, I've watched this, the Long Island medium. The devil has, the devil has metamorphosized. There was a time that Dracula looked like Dracula. Come on, somebody, help me out. You know, Bella Lugosi, remember that? Collar way up like that. <laughs> nowadays, nowadays, demonic worshipers look like I do. That's why I don't take a person's credit credibility based on what they look like. Check it out by God's word. What was my story all about? I forgot. <laughs> the point is, the point is, when I told that young boy not to believe that that was his mom's spirit, it never happened again. Today, lies are conveyed with such conviction, even among Christians, that one would think that the idea that the soul is immortal is taught in Scripture. Can I share some Bible with you? Can I show you what the Word of God says? Now, the question is, how, how can Christians... And Satanists believe the same thing. Something is wrong when a Christian pastor and a Satanist is teaching the same thing. Something is wrong when the pulpits of America and the pulpits around the world are in harmony with demons and witches and warlocks in their beliefs about what happens when a person dies. But the Bible describes how Satan seeks to give credibility to false teachings. Look at Paul the Apostle's words in 2 Timothy chapter 11, verse 13. Here's what he says. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Brethren, you want safety? Check everything out by God's Word. Amen. That's why today you don't hear a lot of Bible in churches anymore. It's all about feeling and emotion and excitement. They no longer say, are you, are you believing God's Word? They say, what was your, how was your experience? It's not, all, it's not about truth anymore. It's about experience. How did you feel when you came to church today? I've often asked myself the question, how did Jesus feel when he went to the cross? It's not about feeling. It's about truth. Truth that never changes. In the book, Great Controversy, look at this quotation, and this is an amazing quotation. Servant of the Lord says, as spiritism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare. Satan himself is converted. Is what? Converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light. So today, you got to check out everything you hear by God's word. No matter how long the person has preached, 
no matter the size of their following, if it doesn't measure up with God's word, don't swallow it. But the main reason why deception is so successful is that truth is often rejected. Notice the words of the Apostle Paul. He makes it clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 to 12. And he tells you who's behind it. We are living in an age where truth is rejected. And here's what happens. He says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power. How much power? All power, signs and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them what? Strong delusion that they should believe the lie, the lie told in the Garden of Eden, the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in what? Unrighteousness. It's amazing how many pastors I've talked to. I've had opportunity. I was a part of a ministerial association once in, when I lived in Northern California. I lived in the mountains of, of the Trinity Alps up there in Weaverville. Anybody know where that is? Beautiful, 50 miles from, Re from Reading. God's country, 2,500 feet above sea level. And I was a part of a ministerial association. They had 16 churches in that small town. Two bars, 16 churches. Every month we got together and talked about different topics. And one, one, one meeting, I just couldn't take it any longer because I knew we all had beliefs that we didn't all believe in. I knew all, each one of us had different beliefs. And I stood up and said, I said, my fellow pastors, I know, as I'm looking at the different denominations represented, I know that we all differ on certain beliefs. Why don't we begin starting next month, each one of us present a unique teaching that we embrace that may not be embraced by somebody else sitting at this table. And then what we do is we go to the Bible and see if the Bible supports that. Is that all right? That was in April. They never had another meeting until the next year. Because they, they, because, they, because they love not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There are many people that would rather embrace money and reject truth, embrace popularity and reject God's word. So when you try to touch things that may take somebody's money out of their pockets, they choose fame and fortune and finances above the word of God, sadly enough. But let me make it clear about what the Bible teaches about what happens when you die. One way to cancel a lie is to tell the truth. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 and 6. Look quickly with me. The Bible says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know what? Nothing. For they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. That means they don't know anything. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now what? Perished. Never more. How often? Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. If somebody's evil, it dies with them. If somebody's loving, it dies with them. If, somebody, if you owe somebody a debt and they die, you are free. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> My dad, got to tell you a quick story. Don't have a lot. My dad, when I was going to school, I called home to try to get some money from my dad when I was in college, and he refused to lend me any money, so I asked his wife, and she gave me $1,000. And so, sadly enough, a tragic accident, she lost her life, and my dad came to me and he said, now, so what about the $1,000? I said, <laughs> I said, you didn't give it to me, and the debt collector is dead. I said it respectfully, and he smiled. He couldn't help but to smile. I said, was it yours? He said, no. I said, well, the one who gave it to me is gone. My brother in the Bible makes it clear. Look at Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. The Bible is clear. When we embrace God's word, deception cannot find root. The Bible says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Is that clear? Some people say, oh, they're in heaven singing now. There's a great choir in heaven. Listen to the Bible once again. Psalm 115, verse 17. The Bible says, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence, not up into praise. 
down into silence. One day we will all go up into praise together. When Jesus gets here, he said it, I go to prepare a place to you, and if I go to prepare a place to you, I will come again to receive you. Why is it that the resurrection has been deleted from Christianity? The resurrection has been deleted. Death is now being presented as an alternate route to heaven or hell. But I've never been to a funeral where the pastor said, he's in hell now. <laughs> I've never heard it once. People have lived the wickedest lives. More lies are told at a funeral than any other time. That's why it's sad when we adopt phrases that have no scriptural support. Another lie told is that we're having a home-going service. Home going? Who house you going to? <laughs> Here's what the Bible talks. The Bible makes it clear what house you're going to. Job 17, verse 13, let the Bible speak. Job says, if I wait, the grave is my house. I have made my bed in darkness. When we die, the grave is where you're going to be living. That's your address until the Lord returns. Montgomery Ward called my house once. My mother had a Montgomery Ward catalog. And they called me and said, can I speak to Maria Loma King, my mom? I said, she's not here. They said, when will she be back? I said, never. <laughs> they said, where is she? I said, she's, she passed away. She's buried in the Virgin Islands. They said, do you have a number that we can reach her? <laughs> I, said, do you think, I said, do you think I'm trying to avoid a bill by lying to you, telling you my mother died? If you want to collect that debt, go to St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands. Here's the cemetery. Good luck, or don't call me back. <laughs> Job makes it clear in Job 14, verse 11 and 12. I'm moving right along. As water disappears from the sea, and a river becomes parched and dries up, so man lies down, the Bible says, and does not rise. How long is he going to be there? Let the Bible speak. Till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. Amen, somebody. Amen. Today's preachers, today, preachers have adopted the lie. You will not surely die. There was a time when fortune tellers and psychics and mediums looked apart. Today they have become more stealthier in their appearance. On the website, women.com, in 2018, ladies, I pray for you, but on women.com, they listed the 27 best television shows about witches that are on television right now. Listen to it. They said, here's the quote, women.com, witches in television pretty much go hand in hand. Viewers love watching shows about witches and magic and everything occult. To celebrate this awesome trend throughout television history, we have gathered a list of the best TV shows about witches. Women.com. But the next thing is horoscopes. Horoscopes. H-O-R-O-S-C-O-P-E. It should be H-O-R-R-O-R. <laughs> Scopes. A summary on horoscopes. Many believe that the validity of horoscopes is based on the positions of stars, planets, and the sun. But Dr. Christopher S. Baird, associate professor of physics at West Texas A&M University, he was asked the question, can horoscopes make people feel better? And listen to what he says. He said, of course it can. But it has nothing to do with the horoscope being right. Horoscopes make people feel better because of a psychological effect known as the placebo effect. The placebo effect is when the belief in a useless method actually make a person feel better. It is the belief itself, not the method, that causes the perception. You know the placebo effect? When they give you a pill and you say, I feel a lot better now, and there was nothing in it? The placebo effect? I know what that is. I was sitting in the car once, surrounded by a lot of young men that were smoking marijuana in South Carolina. Remember very well, the placebo effect. Very well known. And they tried to get me to smoke marijuana. I said, I refuse. I'm not going to do it. The windows are rolled up. I was in the car. <laughs> it was full of smoke. I said, I refuse to smoke. I will not do it. I refuse <laughs> to smoke. 
I will not do it. I will not smoke marijuana. <laughs> Somebody once said to me, you don't need marijuana. My brothers and sisters, as we are smiling this afternoon, let me make it very clear. We got to begin to trust God's word. Can somebody say amen? amen? This generation, the darkness that exists in this generation is no surprise to God. But it need not be a surprise to us either. We have been given the responsibility to proclaim an undiluted three angels' messages, one that will counteract the counterfeit. That's why the Lord impressed me to write this book, The Three Angels' Messages, in summary. It exposes Babylon, its lies, its falsehoods, its teachings that have embraced Christianity and has darkened the world. But God is calling us to a time that we must now bring the truth back to the forefront. We must not even adopt teachings and ideologies that are not found in God's Word. Can somebody say amen? amen. And the positions of the stars and the, position, the positions of the stars may be constant, but the planets continually move. Don't base your tomorrow on something that you read in a newspaper. Don't base it on somebody else's ideology. And the whole thing that's behind it, it's all about the almighty dollar. And people pay for success. Well, rather than paying for success, if you pray for success, God will give it to you if he knows that's what you need. The Bible says when the Lord made the planets... When the Lord made the planets, he made them for an intentional purpose. Here's what the Bible says in Genesis 1 and verse 14. Not for the horoscope, not for astrology. The Bible says, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and for what else? For years. And that hasn't changed. But don't base your tomorrow on the deceptive practices of a generation that is coded in a satanic presence. It's everywhere. You just drive down the freeway, get off at the exits, look around you, begin to be familiar with your surroundings. But even more than that, parents, let me challenge you, know what your children are watching. I did a series not too long ago. If you haven't seen it, you should. It's called Unclean Spirits. The occult and the entertainment industry Disney World, wrapped in occult beliefs. You want to find cartoons nowadays? More of the cartoons today are teaching your children about darkness, witches and warlocks and demons. So while you're cleaning the house and you put them in front of Disney, they're watching Disney and they'll get up dizzy. <laughs> you'll get that on Wednesday. Their minds are being polluted and you wonder why they have no attention for godly things. Children come to church, and when you start singing hymns, they can't even identify. Because all, their, all week long, their minds are being pounded by words, occult words, words that are demonic, words that are sensual, words that are dark, words that are polluted, words that are corrupting the minds of our young. And we buy them cell phones as though it's some kind of act of liberty. Over in Europe, they're getting wise now. I think in some of the Scandinavian countries, it's against the law for children 18 years old and under to own a cell phone. The young, man that, the young man that was part of the development of Facebook, I watched the video several times. He said, I am pained to see what my participation has done to American and world society. He refused to give his children cell phones. And Steve Jobs, when he was alive, he wouldn't give his children cell phones. And Bill Gates, the, the, the founder of Microsoft, wouldn't give his children cell phones. We give our kids cell phones as though it's some act of liberty. But if we don't curb it, my brothers and sisters, you open them to a portal that you have no idea. Like Adam standing in the Garden of Eden, you have no idea that you're about to open Pandora's box. But I say to you as I close, the only good thing about Satan's deceptions is they are about to come to an eternal end. Amen. Psalm 37, verse 10, the Bible says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Come on, say amen, somebody. Amen. Indeed, you'll look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. And by the way, i got to add it right here, since i got about an extra minute. There is no such thing as an eternally burning hell. Read your Bible. 
Let me ask a simple question. Is the devil going to be around forever? Yes or no? Well, if the devil's not going to be around forever, why would the people he deceived be in hell burning forever? He himself will be consumed in the fires of hell. But that's another lie he's told. I wish I had two more hours. That's another lie he's told, eternally burning hell, the immortal soul, you die and go to heaven, people in hell now withering. That's a misrepresentation of the character of God. One day all these lies will be brought down. Satan once said, I will be like the most high. Let me give you an update. Can I give you an update? The very one that once said, I'll be like the most high. Here's the update, Revelation 12, 12. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a what? Short. What do you say? I will be like the most high. The Lord said, no, you're not. Your time is running out. Soon every lie will be brought down and every truth that was suppressed will rise eternally. The box that condemned sin will forever be eradicated. And I said this again, but I think it fits right here. One day, sin will be eradicated. One day, death will be exterminated. One day, pain will be eliminated. And sorrow will be terminated. Come on, somebody, say amen. One day, war will be assassinated. Hate will be obliterated. Sinners will be extricated. Life will be celebrated. Satan will be annihilated. And Jesus will be vindicated. So hold on. And all these lies that have caused us pain and heartache and deception and have twisted Christianity into nothing more than a lifeless pretzel will one day not even be a thought for the former things will not be remembered nor come into mind. You want to be a star? Follow Jesus. When he comes back, we will shine like stars forever and ever. Why? Because we have made the Lord our trust, his word our foundation, and the truth our shield and our defense. Keep trusting God's word, for one day darkness will end and the truth of God's word will reign forever. God bless you.